Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I'm Ruth Shelley, president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our live weekly membership meeting. As our banner says, Rotary opens opportunities to find solutions for today's challenges. Healing from the pandemic, recovery from the economic downturn, and peace building as we seek racial justice. Today, we turn to door number three, peace building, as we hear from Nike Green and her work with Portland's Office of Violence Prevention. But first, let's welcome Rotarian Patrick Galvin for our reflection. Patrick? Thank you, President Ruth. So I recently stepped down as president of our charitable trust. I'm now past president, the best position in our club, past president of anything. And in the three years that I've been on the trust board, I've come to appreciate the depth and breadth of the difference that our club makes in our community, as well as globally, through all of the tremendous work that all of you do on our committees. And that's why I'm really encouraged when I think about the future of Rotary in general and the future of our club specifically. And I think that we will be fine as long as we remember the words of our founder, Paul Harris, who said that whatever Rotary may mean to us, to the world, it will be known by the results it achieves. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Meaningful words. Of course, if any of you would like to give the reflection at an upcoming meeting, please don't hesitate to let us know. And now we'd like to welcome any virtual guests. At this time, I'll ask you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Thank you for tuning into our weekly meeting. Also in the chat box, you'll find a link to guest registration. We're eager for you to fill it out so that we can stay in touch. And it's August, still August. I would like to extend a happy birthday to everyone with birthdays this month. We alternate each week honoring birthdays and rotary anniversaries. Please note the names of these birthday people and reach out to one of them with a call or an email since in-person celebrations continue to be limited. It's a small way for us to stay connected. And congratulations, all you birthday people. Now we're going to enter a virtual table talk. In a few minutes, all of us will disappear from here and then reappear in a virtual room with just a few other Rotarians. The Rotarians in your group will be at random if you don't know each other, please introduce yourselves. A minute or so before you come back to this main meeting, you'll get a visual heads up. And although you never lack for things to discuss, may I suggest a topic for your breakout room? Please share with your fellow Rotarians an idea of how we as individuals can advance peace building in our community. Or perhaps talk about someone that you admire as a peace builder. Thank you, and here we go into our breakout rooms. Now, please welcome Rotarian Niha Dawida to announce this year's golf tournament. Niha? We are having our golf tournament this year on September 10th at Langdon Farms. I'm hoping that uh, you guys will be able to enjoy, join us. Yes, we will be having social distancing, and there will be a cart divider in the cart so you'll have a plastic shield between you and the, and the driver and or the other passenger. And it, tea time is 1.45 at Langdon Farms. And it is about a buck 25 or $125. We are going to include lunch, golf, uh, driving range, and fun. Uh, sorry, we cannot have a sit down dinner, but this is what the circumstances we're dealing with right now. Registration is open. And if you have any question or you would like to be a sponsor, call me or email me, 503-939-6666. I am here to answer any questions you have. Hopefully we'll see you on the 10th in person. <laughs> no virtual golf. Of course, golf is one of those few sports that can actually be played safely 
in this era of physical distancing. And thank you, Siobhan, for putting the registration into the chat box. If you'd like to register now, just go to the chat and you can see it there. Now on to our speaker. After our speaker today is finished, if you'd like to ask Nike a question, Maria will moderate the Q&A through the chat box and we'll give you more instructions then. But now please welcome Rotarian Phil Levison as today's chair of the day. Phil? Thank you, Ruth. I've known Nike Green for a number of years through the crisis response team of the Portland Police Bureau and through the Community Peace Collaborative. I can tell you that she has a passion for collaborative communities, education, engaged families, and celebrating diversity. Nike has a master's degree in marriage and family therapy from George Fox University, a bachelor's degree from Warner Pacific University, and is a licensed marriage and family therapist. <clears throat> Prior to becoming the director, Office of Violence Prevention in 2019, she was with Portland Center for Performing Arts as the Director of Education and Community Engagement. She has over 10 years of experience in management, community engagement, re-entry, youth advocacy, mentoring, and youth violence prevention and interruption. She brings all of those skills and energy to the Mayor's Office as the Director, Office of Violence Prevention. On a personal note, she's married to Pastor Herman Green, has four amazing children, and as an extra activity, coaches girls basketball at Roosevelt High. Please give Nike a warm rotary welcome. Thank you so much, Phil. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And for all of you who love presentations, I will let you know that I will do my best to follow the presentation, but most importantly, uh, contribute the content. So, Phil, so thank you so much. And for all of the, you that are a part of the Rotary for inviting me here and allowing me to have this space to not only just share about our office, but to share about what impacts our community and all the great work that uh, many of you on this line have already been participants um, and support and partners of. And so today, um, as Phyllis said, I just come to lean in to highlight a few things and, and share about what's happening um, within our community and your community. So I'm the director of the Office of Violence Prevention. Um, this is the grounding of the work right here. Whenever someone says, why do you do what you do? It's these numbers that 397 shootings just from January to August 12th in 2020. For the entire year of 2019, there was 388. We've already surpassed how many shootings that we've had in the prior year. July, the point I want you guys to see is Usually we talk about homicides, but we forget about those that are injured, those that are impacted by these shootings. And so a lot of times we don't realize their lives have been changed forever, not just because someone has passed away, but someone is paralyzed, someone has been shot. We heard about the three-year-old and the five-year-old in Gresham. These impacts us all. And already from August 1st to August 12th, there were over 36 shootings in 12 days. And last year there was only 41 for the entire month of August. So what, what is the vision of our office? And I just wanted to ground you for a moment to realize why this work is so important, but the overall vision is nothing really complex. It's just that families and communities will be safer and more secure, supported and healthy because of a coalition that's actively involved in meaningful violence prevention efforts. So that is the core of what we do, that we all should feel safe and secure and supported and healthy. So what is our core mission? It's simple, to reduce violence in, in Portland, Oregon. And so our office, we address those complex factors that drive violence in our city. So what are all the different types of violence that, that we address and that we know we're impacted by? Well, there's domestic violence and intimate partner violence, sexual violence and trafficking, bullying, gang violence, gun violence, self-directed violence or suicide, self-harm drug-related violence. And there's also institutional racism violence, right? So those structural uh, 
um, forms that impede and, and oppress and cause more violence to be incurred and impacted by our families. So what is our office responsible for? Just structurally so you understand, we get referrals from all uh, types of families who went from all types of violence. But we're, we, we are tasked with reducing gun violence and its um, impact on our community. So gun violence for us, we talk about a lot and we center because that's what we're tasked with. So violence and homicide, it's a high priority concern. But gun violence is a problem that we actually can do something about in the near term. And it requires a focus on those that are highest risk of violence. I just want us to remember today that unlike other forms of violence, gun violence particularly can impact an entire community and a family for generations. That no community, whether it's affluent or poor or urban, suburban or rural, is immune from the devastating effects of gun violence. And I wanna be very clear, when we say gun violence, try your best not to attach what type of gun violence. Gun violence, period, across the board, regardless of whether that, that the person holding it is a police officer, is a gang member, is a, is a domestic spouse, it's the impact of gun violence in itself that we know we're all impacted by. So with all the other types of violence, we just take a supportive role. We serve the families and we really um, lean on the supports of our stakeholders that actually have the ability to serve in those lanes because those strategies are different. You can't take a gun violence strategy to approach domestic violence and you can't take an anti-bullying strategy to uh, address gun violence. They take different stakeholders and different strategies to make sure that they have the outcomes that they need. So what is the work of our office? So again, we focus on youth and families that um, are most vulnerable um, to be involved or to be a victim of a serious crime. Our job is to identify best practices and national best practices and services to respond to the current community violence issues, making sure we have a pulse on what's happening in our community and what's driving the, the, the epidemic or the uptick in the different types of violence. So we have continued to identify strategic partnerships to eliminate barriers that contribute to the violence that impact our youth. And we consider you one of those partnerships. So who are we and what is it? So we're in the middle of, of, of a re-envision. So uh, the question people ask all the time, are you the Office of Youth Violence Prevention or are you the Office of Violence Prevention? Well, when I came into the office, we realized that we needed to do what we're doing today, which is to really clarify to people, what does our office do and who are we? So we wanted to align our efforts, make sure that we have measurable outcomes and that the practice and join with community and government agencies was clear on how we reduce violence. We also wanted to re-envision what an aligned effort looked like. How do we become the hub where everyone plugs in so we understand what is our strategy together and what's the lane and the role that I play? Whether I'm of the police bureau, probation and parole, or a rotary club, or a mom's demand action, or a mother of a victim, or an OG that is saying, I don't want to be a part of this life anymore. How do we plug them in? And so we want to re-envision and rename. So don't worry about all that's on this slide. Again, the, the point is we're moving from the Office of Youth Violence Prevention to the Office of Violence Prevention. We had street level gang outreach. We are calling them street level outreach because every family and every individual that we serve or that is referred to us is not specifically in a gang. And so we didn't want to limit the services or the understanding of their services. And the same way with our gang impacted family team coordinator, as now our violence and trauma impacted family um, coordinator, because that's where our referred families go through. And they're not always gang members and always tied to that, but they need the services and the supports that we can connect them with and directly supply to them. Again, we will make this PowerPoint available uh, to your Rotary Club so you don't have to worry about notes and note taking. So what's our service delivery model? How do we do this and why? So we're the central station. Um, we're the hub. So families come directly to us through referrals and some directly without a referral. And so what do we do? Directly through our office and our staff, we triage. We see what the immediate need is. We advocate for them. We support um, and relieve support. Sometimes that means food. Sometimes that means um, making sure that they have a place to stay. Sometimes making sure that they just are connected with different services that they need. And we are part of that wraparound service. Then we also do referral services, and you'll hear about these programs later. 
um, which is our Healing Hurt People, our outreach mentors, trauma and violence impacted needs, crisis response team. But we make sure we connect them with people in the community that can provide the resources they need ongoing to build their own family capacity. So we're also the hub for the community. As Phil has said, we convene meetings. We make sure that we set a platform for our community to plug in, to be informed and to inform us about what services they provide. And then we can explain to them what we do and see where there's some low hanging fruit and some big takeaways that we can build these partnerships so that we can make sure that families are getting served the way they need to. Partnering agencies, again, um, we are over our task force. So we work um, in contingent with our police bureau, our probation parole, U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, our JCC, our local public safety committee, um, our task force. It is a large group of agencies that try to get together to look at best practices and make sure we're doing what we need to do in our lanes, prevention, intervention, uh, interruption, and or suppression. And again, um, as you see, partnering um, NGOs, nonprofits, and community-based organizations, coordinating those direct services, trying to be the hub to plug people in so that we don't always have silos um, or these pockets of success and then and, and not have more of a larger collective impact. So how do we work? We work in three different lanes, the lane of prevention, the lane of intervention, and interruption. So these next slides, I'm gonna go over pretty quickly, um, but I wanna highlight what that looks like. So in the lane of prevention, this is where we talk about root cause. This is going upstream. This is looking at structures and systems. This is looking at what drives an individual, right? What is, what is their own legacy and history within their family? This is looking at school to prison pipelines. This is looking at healthcare. This is looking like access. All these things where we're like, come on, gun violence or any types of violence, that's a symptom, right? So prevention goes upstream and really starts looking at what are those core issues? For our office, this is usually looking at the population of elementary school to middle school kids um, and, 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 and their lower risk. So that, and we connect them with mentors, outreach workers, cultural specific programs, and, and so on. This is where we see long-term reduction in violence. You don't see an immediacy when you go upstream. So this is the part that sometimes people are confused because when you start going upstream, you don't see the outcome. All of a sudden you're like, okay, there was still a shooting you know, yesterday, right? So this is not the lane where you're gonna actually see immediate short-term, but you're gonna see the long-term. And all these lanes we believe and we know have to be occupied. It cannot be one or the other. We can't just go upstream and then leave the immediacy alone. So intervention lane, again, um, this one is both downstream and upstream. So it's a little higher level of case management and training need to work with this population. Um, these are usually middle school to high schoolers and their families that are attached to them. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're, they're, they're on the radar because they start having school attendance issues, behavior issues. They might have been impacted by directly a trauma event, right? You're right there on the scene when it happens, uh, transitional events, um, or they might be a victim of um, some other types of violence, bullying, et cetera, or they have a family member who is very high risk and involved in um, some type of uh, gun violence. We can see short and long-term gains um, with this actual lane. So we have trained mentors. So this isn't just your, your average mentoring program. This is the mentors that specifically look at risk factors and they look at protective factors around violence. And they want to make sure that they're increasing those protective factors. And so our in, we also have intensive case managers. So this is not a group style. This is much larger one-on-one. -on -one. How do we make sure there's a co-created plan and we're serving this individual and their family along the way, long-term committed so they get the outcomes that they're looking for. And all the best, best practices are mentioned here. So the last lane is what I was referring to before is the interruption lane. And remember, this is all prevention and intervention. This has nothing to do with suppression. This is not law enforcement. This is not probation and parole. This is what we do as an office and how we partner um, with our different nonprofits to do specific work in these lanes. So this is our highest risk. These are individuals who are um, what we know are at the highest risk to becoming a victim or to become an offender. 
So they're not on the wanted list. There's no, um, you know, probation and parole doesn't have a, a warrant out for their arrest and neither do the police. This is those ones that you want to catch, but they're so close to it that you are trying to do everything as much as possible to make sure they make a different decision. And so this is short term reduction. This is where we can see some immediacy. So we actually, for this group, as they're identified and they might be close to a scene, they might have been recently shot um, or a victim. Um, and so we connect them with a life coach, which is a credible messenger. We, uh, and that means they've been in um, the life, whether that's a gang life or a high risk gun violence life. And they have contact with them every single day. And they're doing everything to not just replace a gun with a job, but more importantly, they have to do some cognitive behavioral therapy. They got to make sure that there's a safety plan sometimes in place. Um, it is a long term. It's an 18 month dedication for this one, either intensive case manager or life coach to walk with this individual because it is very hard for someone who's very deep in the life to make these really difficult decisions um, and may or may not have the life skills or uh, the ability just to live life as normal as any other person because a lot of times there's mental health and there's all type of other dri driving factors. So that's our interruption lane. So that's kind of like the three lanes of operation. Um, I am just gonna high level what we do in our office the guiding framework at the end of the day is we know that youth and adult violence can be permit, um, prevented. That's why we do what we do. The other stuff you can see later, but we wouldn't do what we do if we didn't think it could be prevented. So uh, this one just talks about some best practices. Focus deterrence. So what do we do? We have to focus on the actual individuals that are most vulnerable. Um, and then outreach and mediation. You have to go out. You have to make sure that you're making contact with them. And then you have to start this, this kind of, it's the cognitive behavioral therapy. It's motivational interviewing. It's that mediation first with the individual and then also with other community members and sometimes con between conflicts, an individual that has a conflict with another individual or groups or families. Um, and so one of the things we always say is we, we don't leave out law enforcement because that means you take out a deterrence or accountability. So we're not definitely, law enforcement just has their lane of suppression. But we also can't ignore the community in this work. Otherwise we lose out legitimacy. And then we can't lose the services or we lose and forfeit the ability to encourage positive change because they don't have anything else to take on. They don't know how um, to move forward without their regular behaviors and patterns that we know are unhealthy and so do they. So what are our programs in our office? Um, healing hurt people. So this is our trauma one response. So right now we are in Emmanuel Hospital. Um, we have started a conversation with OHSU. Uh, those are our trauma one hospitals um, that are local. And so what happens is any individual um, who is a, a victim of shootings and sometimes stabbings that are of color that uh, show up to that hospital, um, that staff is called. And then they show up to that hospital and they begin within that four hour window of retaliation, which evidence-based practices says that's the time you get in there because those are when decisions are made about whether they're gonna retaliate if some, or a family member is gonna retaliate or if someone else connected to them. So we try to get in there and talk with the family. Um, in the beginning of COVID-19, that was disconnected, but now it's reconnected. So uh, they are part of the case management team. They put their PPPE on, they get in there and they work very hard with those families and those victims uh, to find out how they can move and start making better choices. And also some just to be safe um, and have some help with relocation if necessary and other needs. So our trauma and violence impacted family program, um, that's where our referrals go through. All of our referrals, where they come from families, where they come police, where they come from community, they come from everywhere. So they take all that information in and do some risk assessments and then they start referring out and connecting them directly or with another service provider to make sure they have what they need. Um, our outreach workers, um, again, they work upstream as you've seen in the prevention slide working directly with youth um, and their families, providing support services, mentoring them, um, creating uh, plans. They have a scope of work that they connect and have a caseload so that they're making sure that uh, these, these young individuals have the ability to be successful in school, pro-social activities, getting them around mentors, looking at different role models, um, and, and really redefining what family and community and healthy can look like for them as they navigate their current situations. Our life coaches is what I expect, um, um, talked about, that's our, that our uh, interruption lane. 
Um, and they literally just, we just got a grant from the Project Safe Neighborhood. So they will come on board hopefully by November. Um, we're really excited about this because this is where we think we're gonna see that short term uh, turnaround of a reduction in shootings to get them with those high level uh, risk individuals for victimization or criminalization. Um, and I already kind of talked about our cognitive behavioral therapy um, and then some more things. So we now have the Portland Restoration Academy. This is for ex-offenders um, and trying to get them the ability to be able to re-enter and think about careers at the city level. So really excited about this project that they can um, find a career path that uh, with those offenses that do not prohibit them from getting employment, but they can now have a career path, not just a job. And so building that, and that program is being built literally by ex-offenders, nothing for you without you. So we're not developing a program for, for people, they're developing a program for themselves because they realize that when they get on jobs, sometimes there are a lot of things that happen that um, unfortunately makes their retention and their unemployment higher because individuals sometimes just have assumptions about them. And so how do we educate employers about what it is to work with someone um, that has a, a prior offense? And what are your standards? What, how do you train them? What are your expectations? Because um, we find out a lot of, a lot of uh, programs and a lot of jobs really don't train very well. I mean, most of us, if we're connected, if we looked at our professional development, we'd all go, hmm, yeah, we probably need to train a little bit better. So even more importantly for those. The, the, the last, these next three, Mothers of Victims, our Faith Community Group, and our OG Group. These are three groups that are dedicated to prevent and to interrupt violence. And they're walking alongside of families while they're going through their trauma and while they're going through their recovery and their grief. And so we support them in trying to connect them with resources so they could build the capacity to do the work. These are just regular faith leaders, moms, dads, uncles out of the community. They're not even nonprofits. They're just literally saying, as the mothers of victims, I've already gone through this. I've lost a loved one. My son was, was murdered. And I want to make sure another mother doesn't have to go through the same stuff that I went to. So they help walk them and navigate. And as far as the OGs, they're like, I've been in the work and I know there's a way to get out. So it's all the different groups coming and surrounding them in a space that they uh, understand and need. And then as the two convening spaces of our Community Peace Collaborative and our IPAC, um, which are two spaces that communities able to come in and to share, to get information. Um, I definitely would say if any of you guys have the ability to attend any of those meetings, um, it is attended by from the mayor's office to the county to, um, you know, to the 12 year old. I mean, it is a huge collaborative and a platform for people to share, to know what's going on, to get the heartbeat of the community and then see and hear best practices and what people are doing and how people are doing a lot of things that we just don't always know about. And so we always think nothing's happening when there is a lot happening. And this is our way to get it all in one space and to hear about it. So um, pretty much the end of my presentation is, you know, people say, well, what do you need for the work? How do you, what do you want from people? And I'm like, just be aware our, our name is changing. The second part is, you know, um, more for those that are on the phone for advocacy. Um, right now, we need individuals advocating at the state, the county, and the city level that funding will be allocated toward prevention and intervention services for communities of color most impacted by gun violence. That's one thing that most people are, have a myth about. They think uh, when they defunded the police that that, money um, and those funds went to our office or for prevention and intervention services. That is not the case, it did not. And then um, we're looking for individuals to be dedicated and ongoing investments um, from foundations and funders. So for capacity building. So again, um, you know, small things where, you know, we're like, we're looking people to dedicate ongoing investments. Most Office of Violence's prevention um, across the nation, they are operated by a tax. We don't have a tax, so, um, and no tax is coming soon to any levy. So when we talk about the work and when I talk about the ask, it's not um, honestly for my office specifically. A lot of times I'm literally looking to solicit to get funds for the organizations that are actually doing the work. And so a, an example of that is our crisis response care packages. If we were to serve 40 families a year and they were able to get a $250 relief, 
that relief package gives them usually what we're scrapping for every single time we get a referral. Trying to make sure they have food, making sure that they have um, a gas card just to get where they need to be. Just all that relief that in a normal time if someone was a victim, our families would wrap around them and they would just kind of like, oh, I got you, bring food to the house, all those different things. But in these cases, a lot of times they have to be cut off from everyone. And so being able to provide them these care packages, which also includes the referrals, their victim's advocate, funeral information, grief counseling, all these different things. Those are the small asks that we're asking people to enjoin with us with. Um, and again, the advocacy is huge. And then the communication and education. We need our partners and our, and our funders, our elected officials, to really understand why gun violence is actually a public health issue and that there is a contagion part about it, that it, it repeats itself, it repeats itself, and people then think that this is all that they have and there's nothing that they can do, and this is the only response that they have available to them. So, you know, helping our office secure funding uh, and resources. It's not always financial. Sometimes it's the ability for people to show up in spaces needed, um, or it's providing tangible materialistic items, gift cards and things like that, that help these families. Help us navigate upstream root causes. I mean, if this is your niche and you're like, man, I wanna figure this out. A lot of times getting a hold of our partners and, and expanding our bandwidth of understanding how we can go upstream and look at policy or look at best practices. We in love people to join in that conversation. And then just use your network to increase, you know, our stakeholders that are invested in this work, um, both financially, but also for um, the community education and the advocacy that is needed at all different levels. So. That's the overfunding. Um, that's all the things that we have. It is a lot. And I gave you guys a real high level overview of what's happening in our office. So thank you so much. Nike, thank you for that powerful presentation. Now Maria Shell will moderate our Q&A. Maria, you put instructions in the chat box, but would you please explain this process as well? Thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Nike, as well, for that wonderful presentation. So think of this as the time where we normally have those two microphones in the middle of the room. And as you slowly walk up, that's showing us that you have a question. So the way you're going to do that is either by raising your virtual blue hand in the system or just write a note to me in the chat box saying, I have a question or call on me. You don't need to write out your whole question. We've been told that takes a little long for people to think out. Uh, but before I shared this, we already have had two folks uh, volunteer for questions today. So I am going to hand it over to our first question, which is Rotarian Terry Goldman. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate that. Nike, it's nice to see you. I used to be a member of the Metropolitan Exposition Recreation Commission and worked with you when you were at uh, the Portland Center for, or Portland P5, Portland Center for the Performing Arts. So it's nice to see you again and congratulations on all the changes you've made since you left P5. My question is, in February um, of 2019, Chief Danielle Outlaw, then Chief Danielle Outlaw, introduced the restructuring to form the gun violence reduction team. This June, Mayor Wheeler disbanded that team. If gun violence, which is one of the things that you've talked about um, being very important, um, that we prevent and we find ways to reduce, why did the mayor choose to reduce some, a program that was so new um, and had just been implemented by Chief Outlaw um, a year and a half earlier? Great question, Terry. Um, cannot answer for the mayor, um, and even more so, I can't answer for the council. That was a council decision uh, to remove the uh, GVERT. Um, I can say that when you want to have a and evidence-based practices is from the lens that i'm going to respond to this um, there were very specific things that the gvert did that is still needed and so there's the intelligence gap there is the detective side the investigation side like all of those things i um i'm not aware of all of everyone's reasons but i will say that at this point we're going to have to re-envision and we're going to have to recreate and reorganize and restructure very quickly um from the side of the police bureau and how to make sure that when we have homicides that they are able to provide the services needed to have um, 
very fast investigations and the detectives are in place. All those pieces that are now missing and have been removed, are they're gonna have to figure out how do they put that back together um, in a way that those different lanes are now filled. So um, yeah, I can't answer the why. Um, I think a lot of people wanna know the different reasons, but I think that the impact may be something that people need to look into a little bit more and I think sometimes people didn't really understand the complete role of the gun violence reduction team. And so um, I think that's what's confusing at times. And for our, our, our work that we do, we definitely wanna make sure that uh, the, the police bureau um, and all of our stakeholders are re-envisioning and, and reorganizing very quickly because we have every single day on an average two to three shootings right now. And we don't have the time to wait for uh, individuals to figure it out. We just have to put those things in place to make sure that those families are safe, as I said in the beginning, that people feel safe and secure and are healthy because of that dedicated coalition, which I do believe that the police bureau is a part of that dedicated coalition to figure out how do they now um, make sure that they take what they have and put it in the places that it's needed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Rotarian Al Jubitz. Uh, Nike, thank you. <clears throat> and I understand you work for the mayor, so you have to be very careful in your answer. But uh, since we deal with the truth in, in this uh, rotary world and uh, fairness to everybody, uh, the reason the school resource officers and uh, the GVRT were defunded has a lot to do, uh, I'm told, with the data showing racial bias in the focus of, of these things. And the, and the Black Lives Matter movement is all about reducing uh, structures that, that uh, result in, in uh, biases that occur based on the data. Anyway, uh, my question has to do uh, with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and focused on inclusion, you mentioned uh, positive, um, the third rail, the th what was the term you used in the third lane? Uh, interruption. Got, interruption, yeah. How, how to offer resources to people on the verge or on the edge, it could go either way. Uh, I keep thinking Rotary Clubs uh, have a role to play there. Uh, also, when you mentioned life coaching, life coaches, we've had mentorship programs in this Rotary Club in years past. I have personally mentored two black youth and I uh, got to know them and their families and uh, got a lot out of it. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking what can Rotary Clubs do or Rotarians do to help uh, reduce, um, well, let me put it this way, to give opportunity to youth that may, may see no opportunity in their future. How, how do we help in a constructive way? Thank you, Al. I think, um, so note this, that um, in the interruption lane, what we have found through our problem analysis is that those are actually not youth in our interruption lane. Um, those most highly vulnerable, what we have seen have been 18 to 44 in that interruption lane where we start seeing a more larger impact of our youth engaged in the violence. Um, the under 18 is more in our prevention and intervention lane. And so I just wanna make a distinction there. So for, for the youth in that intervention lane, I think that we're constantly looking for mentors. Um, so I think that's definitely a lane and we need trained mentors. And so a lot of times, you know, we have a lot of programs out there, even cultural specific programs that provide some amazing mentoring programs, but these are the kids that get kicked out of the mentoring programs. So I want people to really understand, like these are the ones that fall through the gaps because these are the ones that you make an appointment, you're at Starbucks and they don't show up. And now you're upset because they didn't show up. Well, guess what? People haven't been showing up for them for their entire life. So this is just like, they don't take 
that personal to you. And so a lot of times when people jump into this work specifically for th this population, they have to know what they're coming into. And so if you want or thinking about mentoring, then our office definitely and, and some of our team would definitely love to do, we could provide a training so you know really what you're about to walk into um, because we all grew up differently. Um, and it's not just a racial thing, but it is the population and trauma and victims and how they respond to commitment. And a lot of times you can work a long time with someone, but then their own abandonment issues, right? And their own neglect pops up. And so they all saw all of a sudden withdraw from you. And that's when we tell you to lean in even more. So I think that's one area definitely that if there's people on this call that you're thinking about mentoring always I think you always have this ability to become the counter narrative right so that the counter narrative of ageism of sexism of all of those all the isms you can become that counter narrative that says really if old people didn't care why am I here or if white people didn't care why am I here or if a person of color didn't care why am I here all those things right or if, if the LGBTQT community didn't care then why am I here right whatever you represent you get to bring that into that relationship as a counter narrative to that individual mm -hmm. As far as the interruption lane, Al, I think um, there are a couple of things that we could talk down the road around um, access to jobs or trainings um, that you might have um, or internships. Um, and then just honestly, different types of relief efforts that if you have the ability, if we put a request out there, we knew um, that we needed a, a partnership. We've been looking for a partnership with some hotels for families of victims that we could just have a solid like they don't we're not asking to give it to us for free but we're asking to have access because sometimes we got to move a family out for a week because their house just got shot up so we're looking for different types of partnerships or relief packages so those are things again if you want to follow up with us we can give you more specifics on what that looks like um or if you just like i want to enjoy the work i'm crazy i have some volunteer hours and i love doing research and i want to be Again, this is a collective effort where we need every um, one on board and all hands on deck. So, um, and if you have something that you're imagining, don't be afraid to mention it because we find out those grassroots ideas are the ones that make a huge difference for our families, especially when we try to circle back to them during a birthday or a Christmas or, or their year anniversary of their family member either being uh, victimized or um, killed. And a lot of times we're just looking for people to share, you know, a card just says thinking about you or that hospitality type stuff. Uh, you, the, our, oh. I thought the black mothers would rebel over gun violence by now. I mean, really, I really decided not to get involved in that uh, so early. I, I would say but, this. Yeah. Can we get people gun are, violence? Gun people laws? are rebelling uh -huh. and people are mad and they're angry. Yeah. What we cannot do is expect that to happen in the platforms in which we choose to rebel and to respond. And so please know that everyone doesn't post on Facebook. Everyone doesn't post on social media. Everyone doesn't choose to protest out on the streets in the middle of the day or the middle of the night. But that doesn't mean that they're not angry, fierce, pissed off, if I can say that, sorry, very mad. Just know that they are. And we have these mothers of victims and we have black and brown mothers that are furious and they are totally upset. But they choose always not to do the same because also there's a risk for some of their lives. Um, and there's just COVID. So they just choose a different platform. And then they, and they argue about that as well. They're like, man, I don't, I'm not gonna walk the streets, I'm sorry. That's not what I'm doing, that's not my lane. So I just wanna make everybody aware, just because you don't see them using the exact same tool that other people are using, please, please give them grace to know that people are yelling and they are screaming. They're just not yelling and screaming in the same way as others. I'd like to help, yeah. Thank you, Al. We have our final question for you, Nike, from Rotarian Chris Acterman. There we go. So my question has to do with how do we go forward from the current disruption? In other words, we had conversations going in the community that were uh, directed at these things um, and perspective have, have changed. Um, we have a huge disruption between the discussion that was ongoing between the community, the police and community policing. Uh, there are many broken relationships um, and th then we also have not 
I mean, when we talk about communities of color, it's communities of color. And the conversations have tended to focus on the African American community of color and not too much discussion about the uh, Latinx community of color or the Asian community of color that have similar but different problems. How are we gonna try and pull all of that together in this new age? God, no. <laughs> um, so you're, 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 you're spot on, Chris. Um, there is, I would even broaden it to say there's division everywhere. Um, my, my human answer is stay at the table. That's my human answer, that we have to remain at the table to make sure that people understand why we're here and what we're doing. The other thing is we have to be able to pause people long enough to slow the conversation down and identify what it specifically are we talking about. So there's one lane of conversation around um, the, the equity and the disproportionate abuse of law enforcement on communities of color and the need for police reform. That's one lane and they need to have that conversation, right? That, that has to happen. The other lane that we need to talk about is community violence. And there's a different relationship that we also, that has some intersectionality that we have to also ask people to remain at the table and have. And that conversation is just as important and needed and all those communities need to be there. We have to be very careful that we don't allow people to do what I call is pit communities against each other, get one little pot of money, and then tell all of everybody to go scrap after that, to be very singular you know, in our, our mind frame and our thinking and have a scarcity mentality about resources and capacity that we, we, we all get paralyzed and numb and do nothing. So we need to, my job is to identify, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about police reform? Absolutely, that's amazing, needs to happen. And how do we plug them into that conversation? Are we talking about community violence? Great, now let's talk about what are those efforts and what are the national best practices that show how we can interrupt and stop gun violence and prevent it, right? And then if, is this about COVID-19 and economics? Well then that's a different lane, right? And let's also have that conversation, but we have to stop lumping them all together because it's overwhelming that way. And then we don't know what we're actually participating in. So my job is as much as I can is to convene to bring clarity and to try to communicate those things and make sure that we're all at the table. What great questions and wonderful answers. Thank you all. Let's give Nike another round of applause. Next week, our keynote speaker is to be, is to be determined, but please check our website and newsletter to learn about who that speaker will be. And again, this meeting will be live via Zoom at noon on Tuesday. And now as we close, thank you, Patrick, for our reflection today. And thank you, Niad, for leading up the golf tournament again in unusual times. Phil, we appreciate your warm introduction of Nike Green. And once again, thank you, Nike, for sharing those sobering statistics and for the support you and your office provide for those in our community who are negatively impacted by violence. Above all, thank you for reminding us that as Rotarians, we can and must be part of the solution. As you said, and President Kate underscored, to become the counter narrative. Now, as we enter into a new Rotary Week, please join me in opening the doors of opportunity for healing, recovery, and especially peace building. As Rotarians, we are here to make our world healthier, more sustainable, and with justice for all. Have a good week, everyone. And this meeting is adjourned.